Welcome to part two of chapter three on ethnography. And as we mentioned, I'm going to be taking a look at the other methods that cultural anthropologists use. And so let's get started. There's a comparative method, and that was pioneered by Lewis Henry Morgan, who took kinship data from around the world by mail. He um, was not able to make it around to various places, but he published his results in um, Systems of Consanguinity and Affinity of the Human Family. And it's information that's still available, it's still relevant. There's something that are called Human Relations Area Files. You can uh, go to the website at hraf.yale.edu and find all of the things that have been compiled over the years by anthropologists as um, Lewis led the way in comparing various cultures and comparing aspects of cultures. Next is the genealogical method. And we'll talk a little bit more about this when we come to the unit on uh, family and kinship. But one thing that anthropologists do very often when they go into a culture is they will develop a genealogical chart to study and to see what's taking place with the families there, what their connections are, because um, when William Rivers made his way to the Tory Strait and started working with them, the people there used kinship terms that were unfamiliar. And so he used a way of classifying kin that help him to understand the relationships that are there, the things that are going on. On this slide, you see a number of members of the Cambridge Anthropological Expedition to the Torrey Strait, and they studied different aspects of Torrey Strait life, but the conversations that they had provided a holistic view of the culture. Another method of study that's used, life histories and ethno history. Understanding age and how it affects the typical social roles takes place when anthropologists record the life histories within a society. They take the opportunity to learn and to understand the various aspects and occurrences that have taken place in a particular society. And as they do that, they find as people evolve and take on different roles through life, if you can imagine people begin uh, children as children and they move through adolescence and finally into adulthood and things change and things transform based upon that. And ethno history is especially important where there are communities where there's, there are not written histories, oral histories or orature that um, we use the term to describe that are very often very important, very powerful ways that communities collect their history and maintain their history. Some of you may be familiar with, for example, the griots in African, many African communities and these are individuals who are able to remember long periods of history, remember genealogy and all of that in there. Their minds are really fascinating because of the detail that they're able to remember. Another method is rapid appraisals. And rapid appraisals are a little bit different in that it sort of um, is not like we talked about earlier, field work that takes place for longer periods of time, but rapid appraisals, as you can probably tell by the name uh, rap, or by rapid in, in the title or description, that a lot of times there's some specific questions where funding can't support year round field research. So anthropologists will go in uh, for a brief period of time. Uh, what's known as parachute ethnography in order to determine some things and to learn some things. 
here you can see this image uh, that is an earthquake that in the aftermath of an earthquake that happened in Peru and how anthropologists came into that to learn things and how it impacted the communities that were found there that were affected by the uh, earthquake. Action research. This is when anthropologists work for and become not just um, studying, studiers of uh, or observers of a particular culture, but also take in some limited forms, some actions. Action anthropology, as many people talk about, Saul Tax, you can see pictured here, was one of the people who advocated that anthropologists do that in some communities where there are certain things that take place, being able to find a balance between respecting a culture, we talked about that cultural relativism, but also sometimes where there are things that maybe by changing in some way or, or altering particular ways of being might prove to be beneficial to the people that are there. And today, they're anthropologists that use participatory action research. Anthropology at a distance, sometimes because of various conditions, including war, political oppression, and other things that are taking place, anthropologists are not always able to travel to the field. So they will uh, collect whatever materials it is that they can and use those things in order to um, come to conclusions and to further their research. Ruth Benedict, who's pictured here, who was one of the early pioneers of anthropology, wasn't able to go to Japan to conduct field research. So she took the opportunity to interview Japanese people in the United States, and that helped her in her research. And certainly in this current time that we're in with COVID-19, I know that anthropologists right now are not able to do the traveling that they would normally do. And so there's more anthropology at a distance that's taking place. Often too, anthropologists will rely on secondary materials. We know that field work is, is very important because it gives a firsthand opportunity to be with and among a culture. But in those cases where it can't happen because of certain things, then anthropologists will um, make use of secondary materials. And one thing that has to happen though is an anthropologist has to read carefully those secondary materials because the biases of the authors that write the things that they're using and all of that can be uh, very biased, as I said, biased. And so they have to take those things into account. Early anthropology actually <clears throat> was based upon secondary materials and sometimes you'll hear the reference to armchair anthropology and what that really is pointing to is that the early anthropologists a lot of what they um, developed in terms of theories and ideas came as a result of travel logs and other things that they used in order to develop their theories so now we have a couple of questions. One is, what are the special challenges do anthropologists working in their own societies face? Because one thing that's happening now is more and more, it used to be you think of anthropologists who went off to other areas, other countries, other lands to study the people, but anthropologists more and more are working at home. And there's some benefits and some drawbacks from working at home where you're familiar. Of course, they're familiar with many of the languages and customs, but sometimes because of that familiarity, it can blind them to patterns that are obvious to a person who's looking at things from the outside. 
it can uh, be that an anthropologist may observe the so-called sacred cows of a particular community um, in a way that an outsider wouldn't and often an outsider will have an advantage because they're just asking questions and observing things and so there's some balance again that anthropologists have to uh, continue to um, measure and make sure it happens and more and more anthropologists are engaging um, the social problems of their own countries and working to do what they can to make things better. One thing too that anthropologists are very concerned with is the idea of ethics and ethical dilemmas. And what are some of the ethical dilemmas that ethnographers face? There are some common dilemmas. The commitment to do no harm, to also consider to whom anthropologists are responsible and who should control the findings. There used to be a time when anthropologists would go into an area and uh, conduct their research and, and move on, but more and more as various cultures are becoming more literate and understanding what's taking place, there are questions that they ask. But one thing that anthropologists, one of the conventions that generally are used is our pseudonyms for the informants in the uh, accounts that make it in the publication to conceal their identities and protect them. And um, anthropologists do what, it, it, what they can to protect their informants. Um, but one of the things anthropologists, unlike uh, journalists, have no First Amendment protections. So if there happens to be some type of criminal investigation that needs to take place, Anthropologists very often will have to turn over their sources and turn over their information, unlike journalists. Another question that increasingly is asked is who should have access to field notes? Um, most anthropologists re consider their field notes to be very private and are um, very careful about revealing it to people um, other than themselves and maybe the institution for whom they might be working. Um, but there are people who wonder whether or not the field notes ought to be open and available to the informant communities because the data that they're collecting surely belongs to the informants. Um, but there are things oftentimes that are there, details that an anthropologist knows may not, people may not want that to be revealed to the public. So there's a, again, I keep talk, using the word balance because it's an important concept when it comes to these issues. The other thing that continues to be a question that anthropologists grapple with is about wartime. During wartime, anthropologists very often go into communities where war is taking place and study the impact of the war and things that are happening there. We know that during the uh, U.S. wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, anthropologists and other social scientists were embedded with the combat units there. It created an ethical controversy. Um, there's some anthropologists that argue that Americans, anthropologists or not, have a moral obligation to fight terrorism. The American, Anthropo the American Anthropological Association condemned the Human Terrain Systems Program, which was a program that they felt might force anthropologists to take sides and trying to balance their military and anthropological responsibilities and perhaps even damage the reputation of anthropology worldwide. So it is and continues to be a dilemma that anthropologists face when it comes to war. <laughs>